This guide is designed to help players that are nearly maxing out their technology that are approaching the season of conquest kvk and the mightiest governor cycles associated with it absolutely kick butt and have fun in all of that sweet end game content whether you're free to play or pay to win i would like to think that my 998 days played can help give you a glimpse into how to prepare what you need to know. And heck, people have watched my other content almost 40 million times. So I'd like to think we've got a thing or two that you'll find that's valuable here. Welcome to the end game, my friends. Let's get you ready for it. Hello, my friends, and welcome back. I'm Chiskel Gaming, and today we are going to help you absolutely crush the end game, whether you're just kind of curious or you are entering it yourself. We're going to talk about account specialization, end game content, even where you should focus your gems. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the end game guide, I want to tell you about the sponsor for today's video, and that is Loot Cakes, a service that I wish I had known about sooner. And now, baby, I'm hyped to be using it. Loot Cakes gives you gift cards in exchange for getting a look at your mobile purchasing patterns and data. Essentially, you hook up your Gmail account, and you do have to have a Gmail account in order to participate, and Loot Cakes will go through and get a look at your mobile gaming receipts, either through Apple's App Store or Google Play or Steam, and then they give you credit for purchases that you've made, and then you use that credit. You can see I've got my Loot Cakes up top here. I'll go back to my screen. I've got 100,000 of them. You turn those into gift cards, which is kind of amazing because I'm not really doing anything differently than I would have otherwise with my spending in mobile games, and now I'm getting gift cards for it. But what's more is even if you're not spending at all, or maybe you are, you can join an alliance. I've created two, and there are extra rewards for participating in an alliance. So I'll show you now. Here's the Rise of Kingdoms alliance that I created. Anybody can join. Doesn't matter what kingdom you're in. Doesn't matter what alliance you're in in Rise of Kingdoms. Everybody joins into this alliance and then boom, we all get more rewards for all of the purchasing that everybody else is doing. So as someone who likes to spend a ridiculous amount of money in mobile games, I spent $40,000 in my first couple years playing Rise of Kingdoms. Look right up in the top if you want to see that crazy video, right? Yeah, this is going to be... Pretty valuable to me, getting some amount of money back in the form of gift cards. I thought you might like to see this. And if you don't already have a Gmail account, you can always create a Gmail account to start putting your uh, mobile gaming receipts to. That way you could sign up for Loot Cakes and start getting money back in the form of those sweet, sweet gift cards. And if you use the link in the description to sign up, which is my affiliate link, that is an affiliate link, but using it will enter you automatically into a $100 gift card giveaway. You've got to enter by June 30th of 2021. You sign up by June 30th, 2021. You'll be automatically entered into the giveaway. Loot Cakes will contact the winner to get that sweet $100 gift card. And I'm going to announce it on my Twitter when that winner is drawn. Loot Cakes is currently only in the U.S., but additional countries and email providers are planned for the future. So if you're totally opposed to the idea of signing up for a Gmail account, you may want to still check this out later for when that does open up to other email providers and also to other countries. I'll be sure to let you know all about that as well. Again, the link is in the description for a way to convert your purchases in free-to-play games in the iTunes App Store, Google Play, and Steam into rewards on Loot Cakes. And maybe in a week or so, we'll do an update video to talk about all the folks that have joined the Alliance to check in on all the power-ups that are flying around. I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens once everybody joins up. So thanks again to Loot Cakes, and let's talk about the endgame stuff. As a reminder, there are timestamps in the description of all of my long-form videos, so you can navigate to whatever portion of this guide you're most interested in. The thing we need to start with, though, that's going to inform everything else we're going to talk about today is account specialization. Now look, I've spent over 40 grand in Rise of Kingdoms, so I don't have to think as much about specialization, but most people are not spending like that, and especially if you're free to play, you get a huge advantage for specializing your account. Now what do I mean? In the end game, there's really kind of four main activities that you can be doing. Field fighting, 
counter rallying, garrisoning, and rallying. And whether or not you're free to play or a low spender dramatically influences where you might focus. Let's start with the open field because everybody is going to be fighting in the open field. I mean, I guess you could not fight in the open field and just rally or garrison, but that's kind of uncommon. It's hugely advantageous to be able to fight in the field, and this will influence the gear, the commanders you choose, because guess what? I mean, not every commander is good for the open field, so you, as a free-to-play player or very low spender, will definitely want to focus on the commanders that are good in the field and maybe good for something else. Another role, again, is counter-rallying, which I will make the argument that your free-to-play players and low spenders uh, can, of course, fill that role really, really well with a combination that is probably, again, good in the field and does really well as a counter-rally. Now, Garrison, however, is where things get a little weird because, look, on the one hand, it is always helpful to have more people able to fill a Garrison in a tight spot or to be the captain while the primary captain swaps out so that even if you're free to play, if you had some really premium commanders, you could do some great stuff. In fact, free-to-play players with Zenobia were crushing it in this last KVK, totally crushing it. We'll talk about how they do that, but I just want to say that the problem is that a commander like Zenobia is not going to also be good in the open field. So if you wanted to be a garrison captain in addition to field fight, if you're free-to-play, I just will nudge you to first focus on whatever your objectives are for the number of marches you want to have in the field, and then steer you toward perhaps a backup garrison situation. Finally, rally leaders. Now, I wanted to sort of advise here that your rally leaders should primarily be your heaviest pay-to-win players, because when KVK gets really wound down, people get worn out after battling for a really long time, it is going to be just one or two places where the fighting that is happening is going to determine who wins or loses the KVK. It's really just like one or two rallies and one or two garrisons where just a ridiculous amount of troops will be lost. It should be, of course, the best of the best from your kingdom in that position. But I will say the advantage of investing in rally commanders is that they also tend to be pretty good in the open field too. Like, Nebu's great in the open field. Ramses is good in the open field. A lot of commanders that we've historically had that are good for rallying are also good in the open field. So this is something you could do if you're free to play, but I want to encourage you to sort of know your role. I mean, I guess what I'm so trying to say is don't be the person who's got like the lowest tech, the weakest gear that is like constantly trying to rally stuff in your kingdom. Every kingdom has someone like that and just like, just don't, okay? <laughs> like, there's a time and a place for rallying stuff, and if you're needed and there's nobody else, that's great. But because you're in the driver's seat with rallies, I just want to set your expectation that a lot of that, when it comes down to it, is going to be a very small number of people that rally a lot. So once you have a good sense of kind of what your role is going to be, there's one other thing about making investments in Rise of Kingdoms that I really need to talk about up front, which is that, you really should only invest sculptures and invest in equipment if there's actually something you're about to do of importance. So let me give a couple examples of that. One of those things that would be really important to optimize for is going to be Ark of Osiris League. I mean, for the teams that are in Ark of Osiris League, they want to spend down every single sculpture and material they have to give them advantage. If you're going into KVK then you want to spend every single sculpture and material you have right before the fighting to give you an advantage. But the reason that I'm encouraging you to time your investments is that you just don't know how significantly the meta is going to shift when new commanders arrive on the scene. I mean, when Zenobia landed, man, who would have guessed that we would be in a Zenobia garrison meta for such a long time? New infantry commanders are on the way, and things may change up yet again. So it's really important to hold back your investments. And I do this myself. I've got a ton of commander sculptures saved up so that when a new meta arrives, you can invest in 
the best pair for garrison, rally, or even open field, whatever it is. Now, there is a way that you can mitigate the extent to which you need to do this, because who doesn't want to do those upgrades as you go? I know it's more fun. I get it. And what I'd recommend for most players that are not spending this ridiculous amount of money is that you specialize your account in one troop type. Whether it's infantry, whether it's archers or cavalry, I suppose you could do garrison as a specialization, but the downside of doing a garrison specialization is that obviously you can't do a ton of field fighting. Um, and if you're free to play, I just don't think that's a great plan. By picking a specialization, you can focus everything on one troop type. And although you won't have all the archers, you won't have all the calves, if you focused on infantry, at any point in time when new infantry commanders arrive, you could probably invest in only one more commander, one of the new ones, and you've probably got whatever the meta is. Or maybe you can invest in just two commanders. You go and max them out, and then you've got whatever the meta is. As an example of when the Cavs recently hit with um, XY, you know, that, that commander landed, and if you had the sculptures to max XY, and then Chandra Gupta, I mean, you were good to go, right? So... Focusing has an advantage for sculptures, but it also has a huge advantage for equipment. And equipment is absolutely game-changing. Now, look, of course, starting off, you should be focused on, you know, epic equipment. That's really the starting point. Get a bunch of special, talented, epic equipment. And then after you've done that, you can start to upgrade that epic equipment up to legendary equipment. And why am I advising that you focus? Because of how legendary equipment works, weirdly enough, the more you craft that same piece of equipment over and over, yes, the exact same piece of equipment over and over, the game will eventually, <laughs> eventually reward you with special talents. If I make my way into the blacksmith, many of you already know that you can see when you look at the info button and scroll all the way down, the more times you forge something, the higher your chance becomes for getting a special talent. Now, I don't think I need to tell you that legendary equipment, unspecial talented, is generally almost the same stats as the epic counterparts. So your goal in specializing in one troop type not only gives you the advantage of being able to invest easily into a new meta when it arrives for your troop type, but also makes it so that you're making the same gear over and over. You're going to pick the same items and make them over and over, and you end up with a special talented set, which could eventually qualify you, by the way, to be a rally lead or a garrison captain for your kingdom and to do really, really well. So that is a strategy I would strongly recommend. I've made 28 legendaries at this point, and only two are special talented, which is kind of a bummer. And that's because I started making legendaries kind of before they announced that that's how legendaries worked. So eventually you'll get a guaranteed special talent, but Uli from my kingdom did some calculations and landed on an average of 3.3 times crafting the same piece of gear to get a special talent on a legendary or really anything. So because when you dismantle a legendary, you're losing half your materials, I would prefer that you be in a situation where because you're all focused on infantry, for example, you're just going to make the infantry gear three times. Or if you have four infantry marches, you make the same gear four times, and you'll have long-term goals. Okay, I get it. You know, the sets that are not special talented, but you end up with at least one set that is, which gives you something really punchy for that rally or garrison situation, which you could eventually work your way toward. The other thing I want to say about commander and equipment investments, whether you're free to play or pay to win. You want to focus on commanders and equipment that are good in the most situations, okay? They're good for rally, they're good for garrison, they're good for field, so that you can move more easily between those situations if possible. As an example, um, XY is a commander I've been talking about a bunch in this video because he was released into the game relatively recently. He's good for field, he's good for rallies, which means he's good in Osiris, He's good in Canyon. That is a very versatile commander. A part of the reason I recommend every player max Esong and Alexander the Great at the start of the game is that they're good 
in every single game mode, okay? All the ones I just described, they're phenomenal. Those sorts of commanders are the kinds of commanders you really want to focus on. The ones that give you the most capability to be strong in as many game modes as possible. So with regard to equipment, because I said this is true for equipment as well, this is definitely going to be relevant for your accessories. Although it will be nice to focus on equipment that doesn't cost as much to make. For instance, this is legendary, but it's, you know, war drums and also Seth's Call. They give nice bonuses for the open field, but are not really good items for garrison or for rally. I would encourage most people to not make items that are designed primarily for the open field because instead you can have an item that is still great in the open field, like a Horn of Fury, but is also still really good for a rally or garrison. Focus on the things that are good in the most situations. Now, a couple other advantages of specializing your account, which is absolutely critical, is going to be that you can pick a civilization that will benefit whatever your specialization is. So if you're infantry, going Viking for 3% counterattack damage and 5% infantry attack, or heck, Rome for the defense and the infantry special unit, those are really great benefits of focusing. And lastly, you also can get one really great city theme for whatever you're doing. I'm using infantry just as an example in this video, but I've got a legendary city skin. These are very hard to get, but it gives you 10% infantry health in this case for this skin. Even if you weren't going for a legendary skin, to have something at the um, epic quality tier as a city skin that benefits all your unit types, for example, if you were doing calves, you could use this magpie bridge and all of your units are getting 5% health. That is freaking awesome. So specializing your account, if you're free to play or newer to the season of Conquest, gives you, I think, a pretty solid entry point for having a lot of fun in all the game modes that we are about to talk about because it's time to talk about the core loop, the end game content that you're going to use all these commanders and equipment for. And the first thing we, of course, need to talk about is the Season of Conquest KVK. Now, at the time of this recording, there's only two of those formats available, Heroic Anthem and Strife of the Eight. There are a number th of things that we need to talk about to help you survive these different game modes and honestly, not just survive, but thrive in those game modes. And the first thing I need to warn you about, okay, is just how to take care of your city. I just, I just got to talk about this because the number of people that get zeroed in these KVK formats is crazy to me. Unless you are a whale, okay, you should avoid your city getting rallied. Just use a darn peace shield. I get that it is very fun, very fun to think about how to defend your city. But just use a peace shield. Even players that are spending a bunch in the game have great commanders get completely wrecked just be careful i'm not saying don't do preparations for your city getting hit you always should do preparations know what commanders are going to go on your wall and for those commanders you should have a couple things ready you should have a talent build that is ready for when your city is going to get hit i've got a city skill build here it is anti-skill build for city i can switch to it blink of an eye if i need to you need to have equipment ready as a preset, okay? I'm failing at that right now. Bad chess school, but I've got a spot where I think theoretically at one point I had all my city garrison gear. I don't exactly know what happened. I must have made a mistake when I was moving it around, but you get the idea. You want to have all of that ready so you can very quickly swap to it so that if you get in trouble, you at least can defend your city as competently as possible, but most people... Just use a peace shield. And I also want to talk very briefly about the topic of swarming flags. Uh, just because you're T5 doesn't mean that's a good idea. If you swarm a flag with five marches, win or lose, you're probably going to lose over a million power for every flag swarm that you do, even if it's a brief swarm. So unless you're over 120 million power or so, you probably should be letting somebody else do that the other thing that i'll advise you and this is pretty standard stuff for kvk but don't drop below the number of troops you still need to field fight 
you want to start to find as you're entering into the end game what a sustainable amount of troop loss is for your account. How many troops can you lose every three to four months and generally stay at about the same amount of power or maybe gain a little bit of power? And if you're gaining tons of power every single KVK and you're already at max tech, you're probably not contributing as much as perhaps you ought to for your power level. And maybe you're doing massive contributions in the open field, but the way that KVK matchmaking works, the higher power you are, uh, the harder opponents your kingdom is going to get. So just keep that in mind. Now, of course, when it comes to open field fighting, you are going to need an absolutely outrageous amount of resources. I've released a number of videos about how to gather resources effectively. I'll have a card up in the top if you want to see that. But if you haven't already created a farm account and you're in the end game and Rise of Kingdoms, First of all, congratulations. I don't know how you did that. But second of all, you should really make a farm account. You like you really like if there's any one thing you take from this video, that might just be it. Just make a darn farm account already so you can get your resources from that. You are going to need them for using T5, which you probably should be using field fighting in the season of conquest. And one last thing as a consideration for KVK in general is if you are going to go all in and save a ton of action points. I don't have that many right now, honestly. You can save a ton of action points, go all in on getting uh, the top 20 placement in the Season of Conquest KVK as an individual contributor. You could save AP to do that. But let's talk about one other KVK topic that, again, like so many people get zeroed. It just blows my mind. First of all, you should always be on your alliance's territory, not your coalition's territory. You're still rallyable if you're on coalition territory, but not alliance territory. Um, and look, you should just always assume in KVK that like wherever you are, and I know I'm in home kingdom now, but wherever you are, just assume all your territory is going to get disconnected. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little horror story real quick that happened um, to a kingdom that uh, we allied with in a previous version of KVK. It was like KVK season four, I think, and five. Anyways, in this horror scenario, um, they needed to rebuild a fort for whatever reason, and someone accidentally like attacked it before anyone else got into it. And the you know it's just a weird situation where like an ally accidentally attacked an ally, and like all of their territory got disconnected by a pass. The enemy kingdom saw this happening, rushed their way over, and zeroed just like 70 plus cities that were now off territory that would not have been otherwise. It was just a very weird situation, but I'm mentioning it because just huge amounts of territory can change hands. Just expect the worst in KVK in order to keep your account safe. And there's something you can do that's just really simple to protect your account, which is rather than just stay wherever you are and use a peace shield, you should just teleport back to your home kingdom. Go back to your home kingdom. It costs you a random teleport, then re-enter KVK and you're back in your starting zone. And for most of the KVK, your starting zone is safe. So that's a great place to be. So not only are you, you know, no longer blocking what might be an important place for fighting by just peace shielding and going offline, but also, you're much safer, like, in your starting zone that they cannot access. At some point, they can, but until they're, they can access it, there's really no reason to stay back. And if you're like, man, I just don't have the teleports to do to do that, then you should be joining One Troop Flags. Uh, ours finished building and needs to be reconstructed here. But this is a pretty standard practice to have a One Troop Flag going where you can leave a march in there with one single troop in it and get a bunch of individual currency. Now, as you may have noticed, a lot of what I've talked about here depends a lot on your kingdom. Are you a strong player in your kingdom relative to everybody else? Then you probably do need to nudge up into that rally or garrison role. Or if you're in a huge kingdom, right, this is going to massively shape your KVK experience, your Ark of Osiris experience. And so I just want to talk for a moment without going too in-depth that Picking the right kingdom is going to be absolutely game-changing for you. A couple things just to be thinking about. Do you want to be in a casual or competitive kingdom for Osiris League? Do you like arranged or free mightiest governors? That is also super relevant. Um, do you want to be 
uh, accountable in your kingdom or have no tracking whatsoever for contribution. I mean, there are even large kingdoms that do no tracking whatsoever for contribution. Do you want a large or small community, a warrior versus casual kingdom? I mean, if you made it to the end game and rise of kingdoms and you're bored during KVK, you're probably not in the right kingdom. Now, one other consideration that people think about is, well, just well, should I migrate to a younger kingdom, right? Because in a younger kingdom, hey, I'm hot stuff and you will be hot stuff. You'll be relatively strong compared to all the other players in a younger kingdom. But the downside of that is that your kingdom is relatively weak compared to older, bigger, stronger kingdoms. So I generally would not advise going back to a very young kingdom. You lose out on gaining access to Season of Conquest commanders. You lose out on gaining access to Season of Conquest equipment. This is some of the best stuff in the game with some absolutely insane stats on it. Especially, I mean, okay, I got to show this off because I only have like two special talents out of 28 crafts, but, you know, especially if you get a special talent on some of that KVK gear, it's absolutely insane. So I think it's better to stay in a Season of Conquest Kingdom once you're already there rather than try to migrate back. This is also true because you're going to lose only 50% of troops instead of 100% of troops with at least the way that Season of Conquest is designed today. You get half your troops back, which is kind of nice. The last major topic that I want to talk about for the end game is just where to spend your gems. And big picture, the question really is, do I spend my gems on things like the Wheel of Fortune, which come around on the Barbarian Hunting Day every time Mightiest Governor shows up? Pretty reasonable to focus on Wheels of Fortune. Uh, there are events for equipment. Those also you know, cost a bunch of gems potentially to do, but have some pretty good equipment. In fact, I can even show you the most premium gem event at this time. Big picture, what I would recommend to you is that you focus on equipment for using your gems rather than commanders. There are lots of ways to go and get commanders. And I get that you're going to be hurting for commander sculptures. I, I get it. But gem events like this one, the Holy Knight's Treasure, that give you equipment, this is the most premium way to spend your gems. And if you're a low spender or free-to-play player, I mean, you generally are not going to be spending gems in like every single event, right? Right. You should be saving them up so that you can really focus on one or two of these that really matter the most to you and you can get whatever it is that you need. So I like this event, specifically this event, for free-to-play and low spenders because it's giving you weapons, pants, and chess pieces, at least for this version. I mean, heck, um, other versions, might they might change that around, but it's giving you different epic blueprint patterns and also legendary patterns show up as well in here. And I think that is a really great way to get a ton of materials, a bunch of speed ups and blueprints. And along the way, you get these tiered rewards. I mean, weapon rewards over here is generally not so bad. So I would recommend you focus on equipment. And a part of the reason I would recommend that you focus on equipment over commanders is that commanders will come and go in terms of their relevance, but equipment you will switch around and bring on to the latest and greatest commanders every time that they show up. I'm not saying don't spin the Wheel of Fortune. I'm just saying, yeah, sure, unlock the commander. That's really important. You want to spend some gems to get some value on sculptures? Totally do that. Don't let me stop you. But I think between the two, doing Holy Knight's Treasure with the way that it's designed today and the way that equipment works today is the better of those events because, again, you can bring that equipment with you to new metas, whereas your commanders eventually fall behind. Besides which, uh, if you're going to be, over time, accumulating lots of marches that you could use in the field, I think there's a reality we need to address, which is that most free-to-play players are not going to have the speed-ups needed to use just, like, a ton of marches in the open field endlessly. Like, you probably can't field fight with five marches for forever. You could do a while, but at some point, you're dipping into your universal speed-ups, which is going to make it so that you're not training troops. And, look, do what you enjoy, but I'm just saying that having three expertise, like, both legendary commanders' expertise marches— is a pretty solid starting point with good sustainability in the open field. You could probably do that for a while. And if you're finding that you can do more, then sure, 
maybe you switch the focus of your gems to commanders, but probably start with a um, focus on equipment rather than commanders, especially once you get to that point where you've got, you know, six expertise legendaries, that's three marches, that's a pretty good starting point. Now, I've talked a ton about commanders in a bunch of my other videos, so I won't go in-depth here on a legendary commander investment order. I just want to emphasize again, picking commanders that are extremely versatile. To showcase this on my restart account, which is much younger than my other account, and also I don't spend, I mean, even a fraction of what I do over there. And I don't even play this even a fraction as much as I play my main. So there's a lot of free-to-play value I'm kind of missing out on with this account. Focused on Esong, Alex, and Trajan. Uh, commanders that are really good with a bunch of other commanders. They're very versatile. And heck, Trajan even makes it so that Ethelfled becomes a super premium commander. I pair them together, and I'm in really great shape. So landing on just a couple different marches that you use is a really great way to do that. And even on this account, by the way, I am saving my sculptures, have been for a while, so when a new meta shows up, I can go and invest in it and crush with the new meta rather than going with a older meta, which is something I considered. I started to work on Guan and I was spending gems on him and then I realized like, do you really want to see me use Guan? This dude is like two years old. Like, yeah, I mean, he's good. He's great. But don't you want to see like the latest and greatest? And what if the latest and greatest displaces Guan? You know, hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, do me a huge favor, throw a like on here and consider subscribing for daily Rise of Kingdoms videos designed to help you get value and smash your enemies. Thank you again to Loot Cakes for sponsoring this video. I've got my link down in the description. If you use that, that does support the channel, which is 100% free to you. And I appreciate that very much. And until next time, you have fun smashing the kingdom.